black women. And you run into some statistics that say less than 55. Less than 55. Now, given this reality, given this reality, these are the type of problems I'm saying to you that you as a student must begin to, let's, let's look at the other things again. So what they say is okay. Here's what they're saying now to us. They're saying, those of you who are making it, those of you who have PhD from University of Chicago and the head of mental health centers, you got it made. It's a class struggle now. Class. And that came from, of course, as we all know, which they kept. See what happened in the 60s. Why we lost the battle in the 60s. Why you never hear nobody talk about the 70s. How many of you people here talk about the 70s? Nobody. Everybody said, boy, in the 60s. And here we are in the 80s. You know what I mean? Ain't, ain't nobody talk. Because in the 70s, those whites regrouped and wiped us out. You see, here's what happened. White women saw their men in trouble. And like all female animals, anytime the male gets in trouble, the female attacks. That is a law of nature. A law of nature. If you don't believe it, we can prove it in a zoo anytime you want to. <laughs> now, what happened, white women came out and captured our women and convinced us that white women were not as racist as white men. And convinced us, or convinced our women, that they would place them above their husbands, their brothers, their lovers, their children, their sons, and we say, then the white gays came out and convinced our gays it was a gay struggle. <laughs> and stole our gays, you know, okay? White students came out and grabbed our black students, said it was a student struggle, and wiped out our black students. And all of a sudden, we up here wondering, well, here's a fight. You know what I mean? You know, it, it, it's not a fight. So now they're coming up with books such as, book is The Declining Significance of Race. Brother named Wilson wrote that book, who is the chairperson of the Department of Sociology at the University of Chicago. That's very revealing. Because out of that same department came, came who? Black Bush was he? E. Franklin Frazier in 1939. That is the Chicago school where you show. So what, what, what Wilson is saying, this brother wrote this book, The Decline in Significance of the Race. And race is declining in significance, and now class becomes important. Of course, Wilson is the only black in the Department of Sociology at the University of Chicago. That's one reality. The other reality, he has a white wife. Oh. Now, race declines every night for him. You know, <laughs> and, and look, I mean, that's what it's all about. <laughs> So which way do they get our brightest students? What we need to begin to develop, and that's what all these conferences should be back, and keep that in mind. The only reason I go around the country is to begin to develop a black social theory. A black social theory. <coughs> now, we, this is the problem we have. Why we're in all this problem, because one of the things that have happened to your generation that didn't happen to me, and to everybody else who's at my age, is when I was growing up, the black community rewarded those people who tried to get an education. Right rewarded them. Now we are anti-intellectual, anti-educational, and completely historical. Don't pay any attention to history. So what they do to us is they're our brightest black men. Some of these are our brightest brothers and sisters. They grab through their social theories. One is called Marxism. Marxism. That's the danger to all of our black students. That's class theory. Class. Now listen, let's talk about, let's do Marx just like we did Maslow. Let's do it quickly. Marx said basically there are two classes of people. The one he called what? The ruling class, the bourgeoisie. The other he called the what? Proletariat. Proletariat. Two classes. And the relationship to these two classes is the production of what? The means of production. This relationship. And the ruling class' sole reason to exist is for profit. Profit. And in order to make more profit, they will have to exploit this group of people. Marx went even further. He said, just by time, time alone, you don't need any intervention. Just time alone means that ultimately the proletariat would have to overthrow the ruling class in order to survive. Because the more profit the ruling class wanted, the, uh, made, the more they would want, the more exploitation of the profit. And, but he said something else. He said that if you had people who understood the science of capital, the science of the, what he was talking about, Marxism, 
you could then raise the contradiction, artificially raise the contradiction between the two. That's where the word raising the contradictions came about, those slogans that the Panthers used and didn't understand. That you could raise the contradiction between these two groups and induce revolution. Ah, but see, Marx lived in 1848. <laughs> and Marx didn't know that this proletariat here was going to see it's called what? Union. And guess what unions are for? Profit. <laughs> so you got two damn group of white folks fighting over profit. <laughs> okay, now, blacks are not in the ruling class or in the unions, believe it or not. The blacks are what Marx called what? The lumping proletariat. Now, the Panthers, and I'm not just picking on Panthers, many of them are my students who are opted to uh, not stay in the struggle for race and did it for class and ass. But, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 the thing about this here is that what even the, even the Panthers start calling us what? Lumping. The lumping proletariat. Forget what Marx said about the lumping proletariat. Marx stated that the lumping proletariat was not a potential revolutionary force. So even Marx said that. So because they're what? They're not mean, they're not part of the means of what? Production. So if we so if you admit that we are lumping proletariat, you cannot say you're a Marxist. Not as a black person, unless you need my professional services. You I mean, you simply can't do that. We can, we can. I tell you, we know Naeem and I, we got this thing going. I always say, the one contradiction in the black community, and I'm very serious about this. I know stuff I sound, say sound funny. I'm very serious about it, is that we have no contradictions. That's the one contradiction. There are no contradictions in the black community. And that is because, again, the thing I'm talking about, Mental side. Let me let me move move on here. Okay, so that takes care of Marx. Okay, uh, <laughs> uh, let, let's talk let's talk about Freud just for a minute. Uh, see, see Freud. Uh, I think you all should study Freud. Study Freud because see Freud took the position that there were differences between blacks and whites, and he didn't put no no type of value on it. He put the value on the Europeans. Here's what Freud says, and says it clearly. Read him clearly. He said that the white race, and he was very clear about it, very clear, the Europeans, he wrote it very clearly. And he had wrote all about Africans, that Africans seem to have a different type of personality. He said the Europeans are motivated by two genetically determined irrational drives, namely sexuality, sexuality, and aggression, which he called the death instinct and the life instinct and constant battle. <coughs> and Marx says since these things, since these are genetically determined traits, that they have two genetically determined traits, sexuality and aggression, that society had to be developed in order to set certain roots, in order to set certain type of condition from spontaneous Spontaneous expressing themselves, therefore threatening the life, the, the, the uh, thre threatening the species. He wrote that clearly, and that is why, if you do, if you try to expose black folks to analysis, analysis really means that's what he meant. You have to see. It's only about four things you can do to a person in therapy. Just for those of you who want to go on, I hope you do, because this is fight for the mind. I'm just giving you. The, I know about four things. You one thing you can do for blacks in a, in a mental health center, anywhere else, in here in this room, is that you can leave them alone. I mean, that's the first thing. And many of them would be better left alone. No. You know, better left, leave alone. Second thing you can do, however, is to do what? Give them support. Give them very support. Give them support in such a way because what they're doing is need certain of your professional skills to, to give them support. The third thing you can do, of course, is you can re-educate. You can re-educate re means that they're, 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 they're learning patterns. The way they address themselves to their life is, you know, is, uh, is inappropriate and you, you re-educate. The fourth thing is possibly you might be able to do, and that's where Freudian psychology came in, psychoanalysis, is completely restructure the personality. Literally give the person a new personality. And so Freud took the position that Europeans would have to be sent through psychoanalysis in order to try to, to contain these natural drives. Now right away, you don't have to be no genius to understand that these are natural drives, how difficult it is. So when you see what, 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 what Harold was talking about, it's somewhat an error. This is what is so difficult. See, what you are and all of us can fail to believe is there's some inconsistency with white people's theory and their practice. It is really not. It is really not. Now we get to your other one that all of you 
Okay, that's Freudian. You can question me in depth. Of. That's Freudian psychology. You learn it well enough and get a PhD in, any, in almost any country, in any university in this country, if you learn it well enough. If you learn it well enough. See, the whole process of getting through universities in this country is expended effort. Expended effort. Lesson, that's all. And medical school is the easiest. Everybody's raving over more houses in medical school. You know what a black doctor does? He's a slave. Our black doctors are some of the most dysfunctional people you want to see. They never come out of those clinics. They come into their offices every day and hear 200 women, a gynecologist. Here, 200 sisters looking at them. And believe it or not, they do not treat those, they do not treat those, those illnesses that they scream at. They treat the sister. And you can, I'm just showing you, this is another lesson. I'm, I'm, I'm off my mark now. I mean, <laughs> I'm going in to talk to you about medicine. The next time you go to your physician, do this for me. Watch and see, don't they follow this pattern. First, they take you in a little room and you begin to get ready, be prepped by a nurse for the doctor. And you can hear him coming. Literally hear him coming towards you. And the most he spends with anybody is 10 minutes, if that. And if he comes in, he's going through his ritual. How are you? If you knew, why the hell would you be there? <laughs> I mean, you know, oh, this and that and this and that. And all the time touching you and feeling you and, oh, yeah, you know, and writing the same prescriptions for you he wrote, wrote for the flat other five. But let me tell you, what he's doing, he's treating the person. And that's very important. Because there's no way, if you stop to think about it, there's no way anyone, if you see one medical book, that's it. But you see, what my point I'm telling you as students, don't let that deter you. If you get, and can think at all, you need two things to get through medical school. Two things. You need the capacity to study and a good memory. The capacity to sit for long periods of time and read garbage and regurgitate it. That's all. That's all, it, that's all medical school. In fact, medical school to me is the easiest school. Psychology, if you really, let me tell you about psychology I'm going to go on that you all don't know. Let me just go through some of my experience. One time I walked into a clinic, so I did my training at the University of Chicago Medical School. I walked into this room, and brother sitting there, this is over 10 years ago, brother sitting there hooked up to a machine. I'm not hooked up from the head, like somebody from Mars. Hooked up. And, you know, and I looked at him, and he looked at me, and, uh, and the nurse was sitting there uh, because it was intensive care. I said, what the hell? You know, uh, well, I, thought, I thought I knew everything about the brain, you know, me and my arrogant self. So I thought I knew everything about the brain, like many of you think you know everything they just know at, at 18. So, uh, 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 you know, uh, and so, you know, and so what happened was, this was, elect this was electrical stimulation of the brain. That's how I stumbled into the electrical stimulation, just stumbled in there. I'd been reading about it. I knew almost everything about it, but when I saw it, I didn't recognize it. That's my only point. The other thing is, as a, I'm just showing you what psychology is not what you all think it is. It's not giving people in there. There's another guy named Osgood at University of Illinois. He's become very important now. Osgood did a lot of work with computers. But he came up with a theory called this, called GRIT. They called it GRIT at the Pentagon. Graduated Reciprocal Initiative Attention Reduction. What Osgood has done, well, I, and it is, he's, been done it a, it is, is, he's done it a long time ago, but what he has done, he decided to develop to treat countries like you do a personality, like you do an individual. That treat the entire country like you do an individual. And the Pentagon uses this. What it means is graduated reciprocal initiative. It means what they're doing with Iran right now. What they're doing with Iran right now, it follows Osgood Law. A psychologist developed that. That's a Then we have, of course, which I think is probably one of the most, one of the five most dangerous crafts in the world, that's Skinner. 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 I never care what Skinner wrote. And y'all just think he's talking about Eminem. <laughs> he wrote these eight words, and listen to him carefully, write them down, and look at them every morning. Those are eight most profound words. See, Skinner wrote that behavior is shaped and maintained by its consequences. Listen carefully. That's why he wrote Beyond Freedom and Dignity. What Beyond Freedom and Dignity did, or that was, all